this afternoon we welcome Dr. Michelle Lawrence. Um, she's from the Western Cape and she's um, going to talk to you about first aid of your dogs. And we, you are most welcome as always to ask as many questions as you want. Uh, we're going to allow her to present first and then we're going to go over to questions and answers and then we'll ask you to introduce yourself as you ask your questions. Thanks a lot, uh, Michelle. Welcome and over to you. Evening, everybody. Thank you that I can spend some time with you and share some tips and hopefully teach you some skills to um, handle and treat your fantastic uh, uh, teammates, I want to call them, because that's what they are. So I deal with a lot of animals, but as you mainly have canine companions with you. Um, that's what I focused on today. So this is a basic first aid kit that you would find anywhere. And I have to say that they're pretty comprehensive and also useless at the same time. So the useful things in that kit are basically the bandages, the crepe bandages. And the only thing I would add is a roll of duct tape. If you had to carry anything with you into the bush, I would take a crepe bandage and a roll of duct tape. So I also wanna show you first what's normal in animals. So we often look at their color. Um, so the top left of the screen is pink. You, me, dogs, cats, pink is good. Pink is normal, all right? In the top right-hand side of the screen is what I would call pale. Um, that usually indicates some kind of anemia. We have a lot of um, tick-borne diseases in this country. And when animals look anemic, that's what their lips and their gums look like. And obviously, if they're hemorrhaging from somewhere, they'll start looking anemic. That very impressive canary yellow color that you can see, that's from jaundice. and um, Often dogs that haven't eaten for a few days also as a complication of biliary will be jaundiced. Um, and that's a sure sign that something's very wrong, but they're usually very sick at that point. So you wanted to know what signs and symptoms of shock are. So I've put a picture there of some more mucous membranes that are that very worrying purple blue color um, that's never a good sign. That means they're not getting enough oxygen one way or the other. The little picture below it, that you can see that dog's eyes are bulging and there's open mouth breathing. That is also a very sure sign of distress. Um, some dogs' tongues in the, in the top right-hand color get this very, we call it brick red. They're not just the normal pink tongue. It looks like a swollen tongue and it's brick red. Um, giving animals CPR is, I have to admit, not always successful. Um, if you're not in a facility with oxygen and tubes and adrenaline and got an intravenous catheter at your disposal, um, often giving um, CPR is, is um, I won't say a waste of time, but it's not successful. Um, as in humans, you can see in the bottom left there where you have to put your hands over the dog's chest. Um, it's usually just where the chest is bulging that you would um, give the heart compressions. And if you had to blow into a dog's, if you wanted to give them oxygen, you close their mouth and put your mouth over their nostrils and you can breathe for them like that. So you basically just close their mouth and breathe in for them. And you're, you don't want to burst their lungs. So as you see their chest rising, that's enough oxygen. And you would have to breathe for them every, I want to say six seconds. And that's going to be important when we get to the bit about snake bites. Okay. So temperatures a very important thing. Uh, dogs don't always show that they're running at temperature. Um, they will pant even if they're not running at temperature. So a normal dog's temperature is between 37 and 38 and a half. 
they will walk around still with a temperature over 40. If it were you and I, we wouldn't be able to lift our heads off the floor. Um, but very sick dogs can still walk around with a temperature of 40. High temperatures are either heat stroke or um, biliary again, um, tick bite fever. And a temperature that high definitely indicates a sick or very hot, overheated animal. So in the next slide, it was you guys wanted to know how to, if a dog is choking, fortunately they don't often choke. Um, they can swallow things that are impressively large. So often puppies, if you try and take things out of their mouth, they'll try and swallow it and then they may choke, okay? In the next video, I've showed you how to open a dog's mouth. I've used my German Shepherd, so it looks real enough for you. The trick is where I place my thumb and then my fingers curl over his nose. If you place your thumb behind the canine tooth, they can't bite you, okay? So I'm gonna play the video. If you guys don't get it, I'll play it again. If, um, and then you can open the mouth really wide, you can stick your hand in, you can pull something out and they still can't bite you. Okay, so that's what I'm gonna do now, I'll show you that video. Go again. All right. So I'll just keep showing you that while I'm talking about the next thing. The next thing is if you need to get your animal in a position that you can examine him, this is how you do it. You, you hold his front and back legs and, um, oh no, sorry, we're not there yet. No. <laughs> if you've got an animal that wants to bite, this is how you can make a homemade muzzle just with a piece of string. Okay. So lead around the neck, make a loop over the nose. This is the part where you've got to be careful. Let it lock and then you wind the string around. He's not hurt, you're not hurt and everything's safe, okay? That's a very useful tool to have in a dog that you, you don't know. Um, I'm just gonna show you again, because that's where you, this bit, where you make that loop over the nose pull it, and then it will lock there. Okay, so when it's locked, he can't bite. All right. To restrain an animal, I've shown you, I've got quite a few videos on animal restraint because needless to say, when an animal's in pain, you wanna know how to do it properly the first time. Because once they start thrashing around, um, you've gotta know what to do in that situation. Okay, so this is the easy one. Take a back leg, take a front leg, make them sit, and they lie down on their sides. Okay. And if you want to keep a dog in restrained, you go onto the side of their back, you hold the back, the bottom legs, and then you're here, my elbow's on his neck, and I'm holding the bottom leg. He can't lift his head, he can't lift his, he can't get his legs underneath him, and you can examine him. You can examine the upside leg, um, they can't get up. Okay, and that's when you've got one person holding and then another person can administer a bandage, take out a thorn, um, he can't hurt you and he's pretty comfortable. Okay, so basically you wanna hold the legs that are on the floor side so that he can't get them un out underneath him and start twisting and wiggling to try and get up again. Um, once again, if you're in the bush and an animal's in a snare, they're always stressed, they always, they wanna go for you because they're scared, they wanna go for you because they're hurting. Um, the next video I've got is, if you're in the bush and you've got a jacket, um, what you do is you throw the jacket over the head and you grab them around the neck. Now the person who does that must not let go, okay? So you've got them around the neck with a jacket over their heads. Like with any wildlife, if you cover their eyes, they do calm down. Um, let me go back. Okay, we're just gonna try and show you that again. Chuck something over the head, grab the neck, and once again, put him on his side. 
my assistant here is holding the back legs, so he can't do flick flacks and um, he can't hurt anybody. But the person in the front, once you've got that hold, you keep holding, okay? Your jacket will protect you from being scratched um, or being bitten, okay? Often when they can't see your hands, they can't bite you, all right? <laughs> the next video I'm going to show you is a live situation. This dog was very painful, very sore. Um, so I'm going to show you how my assistant covers its head. And in the next video, how the real life situation in, in, in a dog that we don't know. Here we go. So she's scared. She's sore. Here we're coming with a towel, a jacket, anything. And when he grabs, he grabs and he doesn't let go, okay? And she's going to react, okay? So that's the one. And then we come to help him because we're standing right there. You don't move away because that dog's now going round and round and round. He keeps holding the front and I've got the back legs, okay? No one's going to get hurt. He hasn't let go of the front. And we can examine her, we can inject her, we can restrain her and deal with a wound. Um, that This video is obviously a more real life situation with a dog that was very fractious and in pain. Um, okay, another thing that I think you may have to deal with is um, dogs who eat poison. Oh, go back. All right, so poison is usually rat poison or um, some household poison meant for rats that dogs aren't meant to eat. And as long as they're still compass mentis, you want to get them to vomit as soon as possible. You want to get that poison out of their system. Okay, now the most brilliant way to do it is with dear old Omo, and you want the powder, you don't want the liquid. You take um, probably a handful and then you mix it into a paste, like the picture I've shown you on the right hand side. So it must be pretty solid. It mustn't be liquid at all. It must be almost like toothpaste or cement or putty. Okay. Then you take a handful of this. I'm going to demonstrate on my dog, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, so I'm just going to show you this video. You give a handful of this soap into the dog. Let's uh, play this and I'll carry on talking. Okay, so a whole handful. You can see I'm going behind the tooth again, open mouth, down the gullet, close the mouth. If you're not wearing a mask, you can blow into the nose and they will immediately swallow. And then within about 30 seconds, they start salivating. And... Yeah. And this honestly takes maybe four minutes. And then they will, there we go. Everything that was in their stomach, they vomit up. And you can inspect it and see the rat poisons have usually got a blue tinge. The snail poisons that they find, obviously with us where people have fruit orchards and things, um, is a green color. The or the two-step that they use up north in Gauteng looks like little black granules. So if the dog is still compass mentis, this is brilliant. If you know that they've potentially had poison, you want to get that poison out of their system as fast as possible. The fantastic thing about this method is that once they've vomited, even the OMO is out of their system. So they're not going to vomit for another five hours. Then it's all over. Okay. Um, Allergic reactions. Allergic reactions can look like a few things. So in your long-haired Malinois, you're not going to see the skin looking like the picture on the top right necessarily. You may see puffy eyes like the picture on the left. And then when they're really itchy, they start rubbing themselves and actually causing a bit of trauma like you can see in the bottom picture. Okay. If you rub your hand a along the dog's body or along the head and you start feeling these bumps. That's an allergic reaction. Allergic reactions can be to anything. Um, the one in the top right is bee stings. 
that's what they look like. Um, dogs can quite easily drink the human allergics. And for a large melanoid sized dog, you can easily give them two allergexes and you won't do any harm. If, if it wasn't a bee sting, two allergexes is not going to um, be a problem at all. Sometimes dogs get a hyper allergic reaction in the cortisone, um, but usually we have to give that intravenously. And, um, but two allergexes is a good start anyway, even if they're on their way to the vet, two allergexes is a great start. Okay, the next question you guys all wanted to know about snakes. Um, up where you are and your namesake, the mambas, I have to say if your dogs get struck by a mamba, um, I want to say it's game over. They, uh, I have not yet had enough time to pull a dog through from a mamba bite. We've got maybe seven minutes to from when a dog is bitten by a mamba to give a huge amount of antivenom in the vein. And it has to be in the vein. The problem with the antivenom is that it has to be kept in the fridge. So it's not something that even if you guys were taught how to administer things intravenously that you would be able to carry around with you without having to carry it on ice. Um, so mambas are bad. Uh, I have no, I have no, um, I don't have any advice for that. Um, we have the Cape Cobras here in the Cape. And in the 20 years I've been practicing, I have managed to save one dog. Um, she got three antivenoms and was paralyzed for nearly two days. That we had to breathe for her and swallow for her and all sorts of things. And as I say, I've managed to pull one dog through. Um, worm slungs are something you would also see a fair amount of but luckily worm slungs are very timid snakes. I mean, your dogs would really have to go and look for trouble to get bitten by a worm slung. A worm slung has a different kind of venom. That's a hemotoxin. So it basically is like taking a huge dose of an anticoagulant and they bleed out. And the problem with a worm slung bite is that they can get bitten today and they only bleed out three, three weeks later. So often it looks like biliary because then we see them three weeks later and they're pale and they're weak may or may not be running a temperature. Um, but worm slung bites, I've also only seen one in the last 20 years, and I managed to give the dog a huge blood transfusion and pull it through. Worm slung antivenom is quite difficult to come by. The human doctors are not all that keen to share it with us, so we don't keep it on hand. Um, and also worm slung is a back fanged um, snake with a small mouth. So the chances of it biting anything bigger than the dog's toe is quite unlikely. But the one we have a fair amount of success with is the puff adder. And there I have quite a few pictures for you. So this is what a puff adder looks like. And in contrast to the bee sting or the allergy photos that I showed you just now, a puff adder bite, there's always a drop of blood somewhere. A bee sting, there won't be blood. But a puff adder, there's always a drop of blood somewhere. And the mucous membranes of the pictures that I showed you earlier, that when a dog's been bitten by a puff adder, the mucous membranes go purple, purple, black. Okay. The other thing is that it's not lots of little swellings. It's the whole face or the whole leg. Um, and as I say, if it's a leg, there'll always be the telltale drop of blood somewhere. Okay. Um, Puff adder bites are very responsive to antivenom. And you, or you, we've got about eight hours from when the dog's bitten by the puff adder to administer antivenom and have a, I want to say, 100% positive result. 100% um, positive result means that there's no sloughing of the skin. So puff adders are cytotoxic, which means they're going to destroy the tissue, as you can see in the top right hand picture there. So that was a puff adder bite that didn't get antivenom. And although antivenom is exceedingly expensive, it's a whole lot cheaper giving antivenom than to patch up that dog and that wound. We did patch up that dog and he had skin grafts and all sorts of other things. But um, um, giving an antivenom within eight hours is very successful. If you 
on the way to the vet or um, not at the vet yet, an ice pack goes a long way to stop the venom from spreading into other tissues. Um, what I wouldn't do is if it's a leg, don't put a 20K on it. Okay, so a 20K means if this is your arm, don't, don't put an elastic band around it to try and stop it spreading, rather let it spread. Okay, because you need the toxins to be taken away to save the tissue that's been bitten. Um, we very rarely use tourniquets. There's no, uh, there's no reason to cut off blood supply, except there will be one reason, and that's when a dog has a wound and it's spouting blood. And when I say spouting blood, I don't mean a little drip here and there. I mean, it's pulsing. It's really spouting blood. Okay. Um, I'm sure you'll have a few questions about that, but that's pretty much what I wanted to say about snakes. I thought another common thing that you guys might come in contact with is a dear old porcupine. So porcupine quills in themselves are not toxic. They're just very painful. And often dogs will try and pull these quills out themselves, which they can't help, but they're going to do it anyway. Um, in essence, I have no problem with um, people pulling out porcupine quills, but one has to be aware of where on the body the quill was, what direction it was facing, and how deep it was. Okay, so if you can look at if you, these pictures are clear to you, some like this one at the eye, it just happens to be in the eye socket, but not in the eye itself. The, I took a picture of that one that looks like it's going into the throat. If one had to pull that out, you know, it might have hit the heart. It might have hit a big blood vessel in the chest. It's not just under the skin. Um, so one never knows. Okay, so what do you do? If it were me and I had the time, you should cut the quills off shorter, but don't pull them out. Okay. I would say, particularly if they're ones in the chest, leave them there and let the vet pull them up. Um, if they're just under the skin, they, you can see they're just running under the skin. Those are pretty safe to pull out. But particularly over the, the chest and the abdomen, if um, quills are what we call deep penetrating foreign bodies, cut them off short, um, but not so short that we can't get to them at all. So leave about three centimeters or two centimeters outside the body and take them to the vet. Um, otherwise, you really need to, if you do pull them out, you need to be able to tell the vet, this quill was coming out or I pulled it out this far and it was heading in that direction, okay? Because all we don't want is to have, because we won't see the hole anymore. And then we've caused some damage to, or it has caused some damage to, um, internal organs. Um, okay, my last videos are of wounds and bandaging. So in the field, if you're, where am I? There we go, okay. So in the field, if your dog cuts itself on something, usually on glass um, and it's spouting blood, what have you got at your disposal? Um, a sock is always useful. So, you know, everyone's got a sock. You can just tie a sock around there as a temporary measure. And um, that works very well. If you've got a buff, if we're still COVID and wearing masks, um, you can wrap a buff around. And then what I'm showing you in this video is if you start a bandage on any dog, start at the toes and work towards the body. So you can put your sock or your buff on the wound and then you bandage from the toes. You don't want to just bandage the wound because then the toes will swell up. Okay. So in the field, dogs are not humans. You don't have to use antiseptic. You don't have to use sterile gloves. Good old fashioned water is the best thing ever. If the wound is dirty and I mean, they can be dirty, like full of sand and grit and whatever, just water. Don't use salt, don't use Dettol, just water is fantastic. Just clean the wound 
and then cover it up. Um, if you have a gauze from your first aid kit, something like that, useful, but you don't always have it. Um, another thing that makes a very good dressing for a open wound is a sanitary towel. So you put the non-sticky side on the wound, cover it up. It's a fantastic absorbent. It'll suck all the muck out. If it's a huge wound, baby's nappies are fantastic. Or even cut out a piece of baby's nappy, it'll, it'll absorb a lot of the gunk and the mess and the pus and bacteria and whatever. Um, but if you want to wash a wound, water is really the best thing. Um, the only thing I don't have a picture of is what we call a penetrating foreign body. Um, we see them quite often here where dogs run into a pole, a stake, a, a, a wooden um, orchard tie down thing, and they have a massive hole in their body. Okay. So that's what we call a penetrating foreign body. If it's in the chest, if something like a branch um, has gone into the chest, once again, if you can cut the branch off and take, leave the branch in and take it to the vet, that's fantastic. If the dog has pulled out the branch itself or whatever it is, and there's this hole, it's gonna suck air. I mean, we've all seen movies where someone's been shot in the chest and they start dying. What you want to do is seal that hole, okay? And what you want to, you want to seal it with something plastic. So not a gauze. Once again, these plastic, these gauzes come in a little plastic cover. So take the gauzes out and put the plastic over the hole. And then whatever it takes, once again, duct tape is fantastic. Just close that hole. If you don't have a piece of plastic, just put duct tape over the hole, close the hole so it doesn't suck any more air in because when the air gets sucked into the chest, they can't breathe that lung will collapse, okay? Um, if it's a small stick or hole, um, ladies' tampons work very well. Take the tampon out the wrapper, plug it in the hole, and leave it there until you can get them to a facility where a vet can deal with it. Um, very useful, okay? So once again, if it's a horrible wound and a gash, even if intestines are hanging out, rinse them off with water, pack them back and just duct tape everything back. It's um, until you can get them to a facility. And yeah, that's pretty much my talk. Thanks, Michelle. That was amazing. Really very practical tips. I really appreciate that. Um, ladies, I see that Valeria is in there with you, but I'm sure you can handle this. I'm going to ask you to, as you did before, if you could... Um, one by one, um, just come and sit at the microphone or the camera and sit real close to it. Otherwise, we struggle to hear you. Um, and just um, introduce yourself to Michelle and ask your questions. Hello, uh, I'm Nkadego Mzimba, the surgeon and a driver. So I wanted to ask a question about OMU because we were talking about OMU. And then at home, we normally use uh, sunlight, mag mag, different types of powder. So, and then the OMO that you were showing us here, I think it's blue. What about this one? You see this one? You can use any, any soap, um, yeah. as long as it's the powdered soap, not the, yeah. not the liquid soap. So sunlight, skip, aerial, it doesn't matter as long as it's the powder, not the not the liquid. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Hello, I'm Belinda. So at the beginning, I heard the doctor talking about the jundies. So I just want to know what causes the jaundice on the dog because normally as women, when we are pregnant, they say we don't eat oranges, orange juice, purple mangoes because it causes the jaundice on the baby. So I just want to know what causes the jaundice on the on dogs because they are not eating something citrus. I hear you right. You want to know the causes of jaundice? 
Um, okay, so the most common one is tick bite fever or biliary. Definitely the most common one. And, but usually they will be sick, lethargic, not eating. Um, and then the only other thing that really causes jaundice is some kind of liver problem. And unfortunately that comes in older age with um, cancer or liver failure are the main causes of jaundice in our country anyway. Oh, okay. Thank you, Matt. Can I please ask a question? Yeah, I'm not uh, that familiar with this, but uh, when you were speaking about uh, anaphylactic shock, uh, if we have the doses for humans, can we use it? Sorry, the what for humans? The drugs. If we if we have uh, adrenaline, like the doses for humans, you know, this is a portable whatever one 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 shot. Can we use it for the dog, or is that too much? No, use it. Um, the the difficult part is finding a vein because that's. Um, it's most effective when given in the vein. Yeah. Um, it's not like the movies where you want to try and give it in the heart. And if you do want to give it in the heart, you've got to have a good two and a half inch needle, which you're probably not going to have with you. Yeah. Um, luckily, they do have pretty obvious veins. And yes, I would try anything. Um, if, um, if you can get in the vein, you can give a full human dose to a big Malinois dog and mm. start breathing for it. Um, okay. that's, that's the main thing is to close its mouth, breathe through its nostril every four to five seconds, because every time the lungs expand, that pressure of the lungs will pump the heart too. Um, so having oxygen being forced into the lungs will also keep the heart pumping. Okay. And it doesn't matter which like front legs or back legs, it doesn't matter as long as there is a good vein sticking out. Yeah. The front one's just convenient because it's quite obvious. Um, the back one jumps around a little bit, but <laughs> any vein. Um, okay. If it's a really skinny dog and you can feel the heart just behind the elbow, um, I would go in from the left-hand side and straight into the heart. If you've got a one and a half, two-inch needle and it's a skinny dog, um, if you put the needle in the heart, you will feel the needle wiggling around with the heart pumping, then you know you're in the heart. Mm. Um, so at, at that point, yes, I would try anything. Okay. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Jim. So. Good evening, everyone. I'm Masingi Wongani. I have two questions. Um, the first one, you, there was this dog, it has it had yellowish color, and then you said that it was having anemia. So normally, as humans, if we are having anemia, we are told that maybe you must eat spinach, um, beetroot, for instance. So I was asking, uh, if a dog is having anemia, what is it that the dog is given? What type of food, or maybe it injected something? What 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 is, what is the dog? What is the dog given to you? Okay, so anemia usually means blood loss. Yes. And that's usually in the beginning stages of the tick bite fever, which we see a lot of. Once they're really sick, then they get jaundiced. Um, dogs need protein. So if you can give them um, red meat, liver, liver is fantastic. But I have to say, most of the dogs are so sick that they don't want to eat and that the liver is too rich for them. Um, so I usually recommend either egg yolk, yellow, egg yellow, egg yellow, or just chicken meat, which is protein, but it's bland. Because usually their livers are feeling like someone feels on New Year's Day when they've had too much alcohol and they don't want to eat, but they need to eat something and they will feel better if they eat something. So you want to start with something light, like chicken or egg yolk. 
Um, but generally, if they anemic, um, red meat or liver is probably the best thing. Okay. The second question, um, you mentioned about a past iodine such as toxic uh, acid, which affects the tissue. So I remember I was very young. My brother was once bitten by a snake. I don't remember what type of snake. So I, uh, I want to know if you are, you are bitten by a snake. Let's take it my dog gets bitten by a snake. If I'm having maybe a string or maybe it's an old rag of clothing, and then we cut the, 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 the piece and then we wrap on top, far from the, the part that is bitten, will it make the poison not to spread around or maybe because it's cytotoxic, like it's a pathogen affecting the tissue, it won't be useful. My question is that, it, is it like, has it, uh, does it have to be a, a particular different type of um, poison? or maybe neurotoxic, or is it a, like, does a string help when you wrap around the, the pot? Did someone hear that clearly? Because I didn't. <clears throat> Michelle, I think the question related to um, disrupting the blood flow, um, as she's comparing it to a case where a human was bitten to um, her brother was bitten by a snake. So, um, but please um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I see Valeria type, if a dog is bitten by a snake, will a string help to stop it from spreading? Yeah, I, I wouldn't. Yeah, when you put a string around, that's what I call a tourniquet, where you try and stop the blood flow. Um, in the old days, that's what they used to do, but they've actually found that it's detrimental to the affected tissue to tie the string off. I mean, to tie that part of the body off now. Um, so if you wanted to do anything, you need to bandage that limb, like I showed you in the bandaging video, starting from the edge, going all the way up, let's say the bite was here, you want to go beyond the bite as far as you can, and then you at least will stop the blood flow in the whole limb. You don't want to put a string around here and hope it's going to stop because then this part will die off, okay? So like I showed you in the bandaging video, you start at the end and as tight as you can, bandage all the way up, all the way up, all the way up, round and round and round and round and round as far as you can till you get to the body. If, if you wanted to do anything, that would be the best thing. But don't, don't put a string around and stop the blood from going. You want to cover the whole arm with a bandage. Hello, everyone. I'm Colin Matemura. I'm the driver. Uh, my question is, uh, why do we... Why are we supposed to use a powder soap for the poison dog to put the soap on in, inside the mouth? Well, you want to get the poison out as fast as possible. So um, putting the soap in the mouth is the quickest way to make them vomit um, and the surest way to make them vomit. So the stomach from when they've eaten something takes one and a half, two hours to empty. Um, so if you either saw them eat the poison or you think they've eaten the poison in the last two hours, you want to get the poison out of the system as fast as possible before the stomach empties and it goes into the intestine and gets absorbed. And then they start showing all the negative effects of the poison, um, which may kill them. So if they still alert and not fitting or um, seizuring or unable to swallow, you want to get them to vomit it out as soon as possible because then the effects of the poison will be less. Okay. So uh, you said earlier that if we come across the, while we are on, in our patrol from the bush, so we come across the snare, uh, an animal that caught by a snare, so we must put a, a blanket in the head. So uh, the blanket is not going to traumatize the animal. Um, it's a rock and hard place because my hands are valuable and your hands are valuable. 
So generally, when they're in a dark space, they feel safer. Um, and if they can't see where your hands are going and you can get your hands around their neck, um, you won't get hurt because they don't understand that you're trying to help them. So you have to restrain them so that one of your colleagues can release the snare, attend to the wound or whatever. And generally when they're in a dark space, um, it will keep them calmer. But as I said, the person who holds around the neck must hold and not let go. I'll just get my little dog and I'll show you what I mean. Okay, so here's, here's my dog. Yeah. yeah. So if you take your hands and you put them around his throat like this, yeah, he can't bite you and you've got a lot of control. Okay? Yes. Um, you can pick a dog up like oh. this if you have to. Okay? I'm just saying. Don't worry, he's on the table. I'm just saying. But if you, the person who's holding just holds like this, yeah. then someone else is holding the back legs and no one's going to get hurt. Okay. okay. But once the person is holding in the front, you mustn't let go. Because once they know what you're doing, they become quick and they get clever and they become sharp and they'll bite you. So you chuck the blanket over the head. You grab the neck like this. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not squashing his throat. I'm yeah. just holding his neck so he, he can't move his head from side to side. Yeah. And his teeth can't get to me. Okay. Yeah. So okay. my, my fingers, my fingers are under his jaw and my thumbs around the back of his neck. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like this. Okay. But now you've got the blanket over and you just hold the neck like this. Okay. Yeah. Then yeah. if they're stuck in a snare, someone else can attend to that and no one's going to get hurt. Okay. No, thank you. Thank you. Now, because often if you can only put a piece of string around their neck, they can still bite you. And particularly if they're painful, the, the tighter the string gets or the leash gets around their neck, the more panic they become. And then they start doing what I call flick flacks. They just go around and round and round. Hi, good evening. My name is Johnson. Uh, I just want to ask on top of that, Bongani, she, she asked uh, the question. My question is it's very short. That uh, the dogs, mm, that food uh, we have to give the dog is for is or is raw meat or is it cooked cooked meat like liver? I must cook. Doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't matter at all. Uh, dogs will eat raw meat. They'll eat cooked meat. Um, whatever they like. Um, but it doesn't matter. Cook, cooking doesn't denature the protein. Um, you can cook it if you want to. But they'll eat it raw too. Okay, no problem. Thanks. Can I may I ask? Sorry, just to follow up on that. Even fish. <laughs> They've got a choice between red meat, chicken, and fish. Fish is at the bottom of that list. Yeah, okay, and cooked rather. <laughs> they'll eat it anyway. But your kitchen might not be. Smelling so nice, <laughs> I would cook it. <laughs> I'm back again, I'm back there. Go. <laughs> so, uh, doctor, I wanted to ask, um, how am I going to um, see or to know that my dog is eating uh, the poison? So it is a difficult one. Um, I have to say, normally the situation is, you know you put poison out in your house, and now it's not there um, and the dog got hold of it. And usually it's to, it's people that indiscriminately put poison out and didn't think that dogs are not gonna eat it. So if you put poison on the ground, dogs will eat it. You need to put it in the roof or you know somewhere where they're not gonna get it. Um, the problem comes with particularly your dogs that people are deliberately trying to poison is that there will be clues of chunks of meat that you didn't give them lying around. Often they will eat some of it, but they won't eat all of it. 
and you'll see evidence of someone deliberately trying to have poisoned your dog by leaving food around, and it's usually meat or sausage that um, you didn't provide for the dog. And sometimes you'll see the poison that's been shoved into the meat. And sometimes you will only come across your dog when they're already showing symptoms. And when they're showing symptoms, they're falling around, they're fitting, they, you know, fitting properly, they salivate. Um, we can still we can still pull them through from that, but that's usually poisoning. And then when they're in that state already, um, it's too late to give the omer because they can't swallow. They're not they're not alert. Um, then I would take them straight to a veterinary facility because then you don't want to give them omer if they can't swallow. But if you see, as I say, it's usually puppies or um, that put everything in their mouth and then they will find something that they weren't meant to eat. And if you think it's going to be poisonous to them, you can make them vomit. Um, and the sooner you get that poison out of them, the better. Okay. So is it going to take a plus or minus two to three days or maybe two, maybe if I'm away uh, at home, then I can come after three days finding that my dog is okay. Maybe someone says it's really poison. It will die no, it's quick. so fast, or it will take two, three days, or how long? No, it's quick. Um, the poisons that are really bad take two hours, maybe, maybe three. And then the dogs will start, start showing symptoms. And if they left for the night, they'll probably die. Yeah. Yeah. But that's with deliberate poisoning. Um, I dealt with that a lot in Pretoria, where... Um, there were gangs of people that wanted to rob houses and they would come and throw meat with poison into the property. Mm -hmm. And then the people would either be awake and see that their dogs were poisoned or vomiting all over the place or whatever it was starting to fit. They rush with their dogs to the vet and then the robbers go and steal from the house. So that's deliberate poisoning, um, which I unfortunately had to deal with a lot in Gauteng. Um, but I haven't seen a lot of that. I just wanted to show you guys that if, you know, there is something you can do if, um, and as I say, if they're awake and they're still walking around and you can, they've either just eaten it and you couldn't stop them, you can make them vomit it up immediately. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Right, Hello, I'm Greg again. Uh, uh, yesterday, I, was, I asked about the internal parasite. So, how do I know that uh, my dog is having the internal parasite? Um, the most common internal parasites are worms um, and I'd say you either see the worm or the worm eggs in the dog's feces would be by the time you notice them in the dog's feces he's got a lot of worms um, sometimes internal parasites like worms usually the dog is just not thriving so they remain very thin, they get tired a bit quicker, um, they can be anemic and pale. Um, so worms are the most common internal parasite. The bloodborne parasites, usually you would notice different symptoms like they're lethargic, they normally eat very well, now they're not eating very well. Um, and a vet would have to pick them up by looking at a blood sample. Oh, okay. But you would notice the symptoms of abnormal for your dog. All right. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Uh, my name is Leita. I want to ask if um, my dog has just given birth and then the mother is not uh, physically well 
and she looked like she's very much sick and she won't be able to help feed the, the puppies. And then I've got uh, different milk at home. Uh, the milk's gonna be help, helpful to the puppies or there is a special milk that I have to go buy to the vet to feed them while the mother is recovering. Um, yeah, the most important thing is to try and get the mother eating. And once again, if she's weak or not well, you wanna try and give her high protein. So either normal cow's milk and put some egg in it so that she drinks that to get some energy. Or once again, red meat, if she'll eat it, any meat for that matter, if she'll eat it just to get some energy is good because your primary objective is to get the mother better because if the mother has milk, then she will look after the puppies. And that's fantastic because you having to look after the puppies is a lot of hard work. If you do have to feed the puppies, um, long life milk is good. Um, ideal milk in a can is better because it's higher fat. And to make either of those even better, if you mix in an egg yolk, what, just the yellow of an egg in one cup of milk or in half a tin of ideal milk, that's the best. So when puppies are between one day old and seven days old, they have to eat every or drink every one and a half hours or so through the night. So that's what makes your life very hard. Um, and then after that, you in week two, they can drink every three hours. And then week three, they can almost start drinking out of a saucer or you can start adding a bit of meat or a bit of pup or pellets that you make soft with, with hot water. Um, so by week three, they can start eating themselves. But if you don't, you, you don't have to get the powdered milk from the vet. You can use um, long life milk, full cream. It must be full cream, long life milk mm -hmm. and add an egg yolk um, to every cup, every cup of uh, milk. Okay, thank you. I have a question, uh, Michelle. So I don't know if it's even possible, but um, can the dog eat something poisonous, say outdoors, the poison that is not uh, chemically made? And if that happens, is there anything in nature that we can use to cause the same effect so that the dog can vomit? If we don't have the powder, for instance. Um, not that I know of. I'm sure there is, um, but I'm not <laughs> that into my plants and things that I could. Um, the only thing that I think, you, no, I don't even think you'd have it, but if you make a very strong solution of salt, mm. salt like salt will make them vomit, but not as effectively as the Oma. Yeah. Um, but I have to say, dogs will not easily eat mm. something toxic unless it's disguised in something very nice, like meat or whatever. There are, puppies are a bit like children. They'll put everything in their mouth and they'll try everything. So there are some toxic plants. There are some toxic mushrooms. There are some things that they may come across. But I have to say your adult dogs working with you, very unlikely to go and eat a toxic plant or to... The only thing they may come across is um, toxic water. You know, if they're drinking from a stream and there mm. happens to be a toxic um, uh, algae in the water, they're not going to know. You're not going to know. Um, that's, I want to say really bad luck, but often dogs will not drink bad water. Mm. And you could take it as a clue. If the dogs aren't drinking, at best you don't drink it either. Yeah. Um, and running water is always better. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, that's probably all I have to say about that. Okay, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thanks for brilliant questions that you asked. Um, very practical. I just want to mention to the Mambas this morning, we uh, facilitated a class with the Chuan University of Technology, where the topic was uh, wildlife security. And it's interesting that um, I just want to let you know that people are mentioning you. Um, people are often saying you should do it like the Mambas are doing it. 
And when it comes to um, rhino poaching, everybody is referring to your success. When was the last time that a rhino was poached in your area? How many months ago? Two years ago. Three years ago. Well done. Two years ago. Well done. Uh, two years. It's two years. <laughs> Much better than most areas. <laughs> Thank you for that. Michelle, thank you so much. That was brilliant. We really learned a lot.